And so we're in, we're continuing our Fruits of the Spirit series this morning. We're almost wrapping up the series. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 25 this morning. And as we talk about the fruit of faithfulness, being faithful, faithful to God, faithful to each other, this is a big fruit. And I know last week, man, I was, I was stepping on some toes. And so I hope you wore your hard toes this week because I'm going to be stepping on some toes again. Because you can't talk about faithfulness without really talking about what Jesus means by the word faithful. Um, Proverbs 20 verse 6 says this, Many a man proclaim his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find? The word of God says, where's a faithful man at? Where, where can we find a faithful man? And, and the word that the Lord sums up a faithful man and woman, and, and I can sum it up in five words, is this. Five words for faithfulness. You can count on me. That's really what God wants more than anything. God wants to look down at you and know that he can count on you. The church needs to count on you. The community needs to count on you. Your family needs to count on you. And I was thinking about Gabe this week. You know, Gabe has been sneaking off little text messages just to say hi. And, and that stopped now. Now he's past that first week, so I don't think we're going to hear from him until we get an address or something. But Gabe right now is learning what it means to be faithful because the army wants nothing less. I mean, they will boss you around and beat you down until they know they can count on you because if they can't count on you, it's going to be a tough road, right? So Gabe is learning that right now. And, you know, we're seeing this in the job market. Suppose a person went to their boss and said this, boss, I know I've been doing a really sloppy job, but the reason I've been doing a sloppy job is because you haven't given me a promotion. Like, I'm just a really horrible employee because you ain't giving me a promotion. If you would promote me, I wouldn't do a sloppy job. So if you really want to see, if you, if you really want to see what I could do, then give me a promotion and we'll talk. Now, you know that doesn't work like that, right? What would the boss do? Kaylin, what would you do if somebody came to you and said that to you as somebody who does so much different things? You'd be like, you're crazy, right? <laughs> like, you, you better get faithful first. Let me see what you can do with a little before I give you my free truck. <laughs> But people are like that nowadays, you know, all around us employers are looking employers are looking for faithful workers. They can't find any. And nowadays people want twenty dollars an hour for a job that used to be a minimum wage job at best. You know, now you get not only twenty dollars an hour to flip a burger, but they'll give you a thousand dollar sign on bur sign on bonus to deliver pizzas. Like I get, I'm gonna get me a job at Papa John's Three months and get an extra thousand dollars. That's how the world we live in nowadays because nobody wants to be faithful. Everybody wants everything handed to them or to walk around and act like it's not my responsibility. Everybody wants a handout instead of putting the work in. When I got married to Rami, you better believe I was counting on her being faithful. And she was counting on me to be faithful. Nobody gets into marriage thinking, oh, well, we're going to be unfaithful to each other. And Christians, many times we want to give God slop. And ask God for blessings. Here, God, I, I'm going to give you the little bit. And God, I'm not going to be faithful, but God, I want you to bless me. And God's looking down, can I count on you? Can I count on you? And here's the deal. The church runs on the hope. This is the church. We're the church. The church runs on the hope that you, the church, will be faithful. Faithful with your attendance, your serving, your giving. Without faithful people, there would be no church. You can't do church, and and this is going to be this is the rubber's going to meet the road for us this year because you know we're, we hit that point now where the where the state financial support drops, so now we're responsible for ourselves pretty much, and either we're going to get behind this thing called new beginnings and start being faithful with our time and our giving, or or you know because. It's one thing for people to tell me, oh, I really want that church to have this ministry and that ministry, and I want our church to do this and that and whatever, and I'm just looking at the bottom line saying, well, give. Because if you give faithfully, we can do more. But the reality is, when it comes to giving, there's a lot of unfaithfulness. And it's not just our church, it's, that's across the board. So for a faithful man or woman, who can find? Who can find? And what does Jesus want this morning? Here's really where the rubber meets the road. If Jesus walked in his room this morning, would he call you faithful? Or would he have some other conversation? Well, we'll know this morning as we end this sermon. So Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. 
I don't know about you, but that's all I want in my life is we wrapped up the men's and women's study this week and, and each of us talked about what would our tombstones say? Like, what do you want to be known on your tombstone? And, you know, and, and, and across the room, all the guys had the same thing pretty much is they want to be faithful. They want to know that they were faithful to their wives and their children. They were faithful to God and they were at least trying. And, and I know for me, that's all I want. Man, I, I just want to stand that day before the Lord where the Lord says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And, I, and I've done everything I could to be faithful to God. That's really what matters to me more than anything. And yet here we are in our lives. We have this war going on where, according to Galatians, we've been talking about this for weeks now, our flesh does not want to be faithful. Our flesh is all about me. It's selfish. It's my money. It's my time. It's my dollar. It's whatever it is. And me, 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 me. Yet the spirit living inside of us wants to be faithful to Jesus. Because the spirit's job is to magnify Christ in our life. The Spirit's job is to make you more like Jesus than you are yourself. So we had this battle going on where it's like me versus Jesus constantly. And yet Jesus talks about what he really wants is he doesn't want just religious devotion. He doesn't want just church goers and all that kind of stuff. Jesus wants faithful disciples of himself. He wants people that are faithful to him. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 gives us a beautiful picture of what it means to be faithful. So Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 through 30 says this. For to be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them to his property. He gave one five talents to another two and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. So also he who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled their accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you've delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. For you have been faithful over little, I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you have delivered to me two talents here. I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talents in the ground. Here is what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he who ha will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gashing of teeth. So Jesus paints this parable here. And Jesus always taught in parables. And I want you to know this morning, spirit-led people are people you can count on. A truly spirit-led person is somebody you can count on. Is somebody you can trust their word. Yet God has given every single one of us certain gifts and abilities some are able. Some of us could teach. Some of us can show mercy. Some of us could. Some of us can manage things. Some of us are really, really good servants, and so on. And Jesus warns against such an attitude in this parable, where where sometimes God is giving us something, and yet we don't do anything with it. And this is the problem here. Is this is what's going on in the in the church nowadays for a lot of people? Is you have been entrusted with the greatest gift ever. Yet so many of us keep that gift to ourselves instead of giving it away. And when Jesus gives us something valuable, we're like the slothful, wicked servant. We keep it to ourselves. And here's where we're going to see where faithfulness comes into play this morning. Is, you know what? Faithfulness is steadfastness. It's consistency. It's allegiance. It's carefulness in keeping what we are entrusted with. It's like I look at what God gives me, and, and, and even if I feel like I don't have much, I probably still have more than the rest of the world around me. And God gives me what he gives me because God knows that's what I can handle. 
So don't, so don't get upset if you look around church and say, well, so-and-so's got more than I do, whatever. God gives us to our ability, but what have you done with what God has given you? And what Jesus is talking about here is really our resources, our time, our talents, and our evangelism. So God gives us a set amount of time each day. What do you do with that time? Are you faithful at that time? Or are you squandered at time doing things that don't matter? You know, faithful at that time would be then, I wouldn't have to ask you if you're in your Bible because if you were giving your time back to God, that would be a given. It's his. <laughs> you know, if I asked you if you were faithful with your prayer life, yeah, you'd be faithful with your prayer life because God's. If I asked you this morning if you were giving 10% of your income back to God as the Bible says, you would say absolutely because it belongs to God. You would, you would make no excuse. But see, we're in a place where so many people are not that faithful. And we have all the excuses in the world because we're apathetic to this. Like, for some reason, we go to church and we think that going to church is all that it is to be a Christian. And we forget that this whole thing called Christianity, Christ-likeness, is really us becoming more like him. Which means when I became a Christian, I took on him. I took on his purpose and his mission. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So my day-to-day -day life is not about what I want. It's about what he wants. What, do I, what have I done this last week to please my master? What have I done this last week to take the little he's given me and to make more out of it? Here's the deal. You have been entrusted with the greatest gift of all time, and that is the gift of your salvation. There will never, ever be a greater gift given to you than the forgiveness of your sins and to be made right before a holy God. But this is not a gift that we keep to ourselves. This is a gift that's meant to be shared with others. So Jesus, just like the talents here, gives you the greatest gift of all time. Who have you given the gift away to in the last week? Who in your life in the last week have you told about Jesus? What lost person are you leading to him? Are you faithful? If Jesus came into the room right now, would he look at you and say, yeah, you've been faithful? Or would he say, no, you're a little unfaithful? Because the thing I've given you, you're keeping to yourself. You're like the last servant. You got the greatest gift of all time, and you're just hiding under a rock. You want anybody to know. It doesn't work that way, my brothers and sisters. And here's the great truth of the story, is both the servant and the talent belongs to the master. And this is a mind change in our life. It, if you're in Christ, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to Jesus. You made a trade. You're in servanthood to him. You're a bond servant of Christ, as Paul says. Which means it's no longer I who live, but he who lives in me. So here's the feel. If God owns everything that I have, you woke up this morning and another one of God's days. Did any of you create creation this morning? Any of you make the day happen? The house you slept in was made with wood and things from God's creation. His bricks and his trees and the elements of the earth. The food you ate for breakfast this morning came from God's fields and farms. The next breath you'll take will be God's breath of ear. Any of you create ear? I know some of you like to talk, maybe a little bit, but <laughs> seriously, <laughs> it's God's ear. But you may say, I own that house. I paid for that food. But who gave you the ability to do any of that? Who gave you the ability to earn income? Who gave you your mind? Who gave you your hand and, and the ability to build things and create things and do things? Who created you? Do you have any control over what happens today or tomorrow? What about this? Do you have any control over your, ne over your next breath? Do you have any control over the next half an hour, whether you'll be here or not? Do you have any control over anything? Because the reality is, your life belongs to God. So if what I have belongs to him, then I need to answer the question, why am I being selfish with what doesn't belong to me? Why is it when it comes to giving, giving tithes, giving of my finances in the church, I will spend more money on vacation and eating out than I, will, than I will give them back to God? You know why we do that? Because we think it's ours. And if it's mine, I can do whatever I want with it. 
You know, if, why is it that we convince ourselves that, man, it's my body, it's my life, I can do whatever I want, which means I don't have to share my faith even though I know that's something Jesus asked us to do. I don't have to have a prayer life. I don't have to get in the Word. I don't have to do these things because we decided for ourselves that I can be unfaithful, and it doesn't matter, does it? Yet it does matter greatly. Have you been unfaithful with what God has given you lately? If so, why are you okay with that? First Corinthians verse six, chapter six, verse nineteen twenty says this: Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Here's the deal, though. Is it your conviction that you and everything you have belongs to God? Or is your flesh telling you it belongs to you? Is you really believe with all your heart this morning that you and everything you have belongs to God? Or do you believe that it belongs to you? Because our flesh wants us to bring it on to us. Because it's my flesh that says, hey, man, it doesn't matter if I abuse my body. I can smoke and drink and do drugs and whatever because it's my body. But if I understood it was God's body, I'd say, no, I would not do anything to harm God's body because it don't belong to me. Right? It, if, it's, if it's God's finances, then when I get my finances each month, then I take 10% off the top and say, here you go, God, it's yours because I want to be blessed the rest of the month. I don't sit there and say, yeah, I know I should give, but you know what? I want a new pair of skinny jeans. <laughs> you know, if I give God the 10%, I can't go to the mall. <laughs> You know, if, if, I, if I, you know what, if I give God 10%, I can't go on vacation. So we rob God. <laughs> and yet we do it so blatantly and so willingly that we don't think he's going to have an issue with it. Like, we, we, Chris was telling me this great this morning. He's hired some people to work on his kitchen at his house. And because the company working on the kitchen at his house haven't had much supervision, they've made a boatload of mistakes. Like, like they're upset with them over these little outlet covers of the wrong color. These people have been walking on Brooks' brand new dining room furniture because they're unsupervised. They're standing at the buffet. <laughs> But then Chris tells me about the other company. The other company has a boss who comes in and out, but never announces his coming and going. You know what those workers are? They got the things that protect their shoes. They don't stand on the furniture. They're like, they, they get the job done because they don't know when the guy's coming. Well, we, most of us, are like that first company because Jesus ain't come back yet. We're just doing our own thing. And yet the Bible says he come back at any moment. And if we really had the conviction that he was coming back, we would not live the way that we're living. God, we'd be so faithful with our lives in our church. So God owns everything. This is what Jesus is saying. The master entrusted his servant with something of great value. Do you realize the one who received one talent received a lifetime's worth of wages? Imagine somebody came to you today here you go, I'm going to give you a million dollars. It would probably be your lifetime's worth of wages. And you can do whatever you want with it. How many of you would be like, yeah, <laughs> party time. Would you even for a second think, wow, let me give God 10% of that. 100000 See, Jesus often taught this way because whatever gifts, abilities, time, money, influence, and opportunities God has given you are incredibly valued. Whether you have much or have little this morning, it doesn't matter. It's what God has given you belongs to him, and he wants you to use it for the building of his kingdom. Now, I, I, I see the finances that come in every month. So does Jennifer. She collects the offering every week, and it should pretty, she can pretty much tell you that there's very little tithing going on in this church. There's a whole lot of people who call New Beginnings their church home that are very unfaithful with your finances. And I'm not here to harp on you this morning, but if you think you can rob God and get away with it, I might not see you in heaven someday. It's a salvation issue. You know, there's another time that Jesus was in a temple, Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. 
Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said to her, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the rest of them. For they were contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. She had the bare minimum. Two coins, these two little coins, Kalitras, were all you could give. That's the smallest amount amount you were allowed to give for offering before you should not just give it all. And that's all this lady had, and yet she outgave everybody. Why did she outgive everybody? Because the dollar amount doesn't matter. It's the heart that matters. It's the heart. When I give, it does not matter whether I give $1,000 or $1. It matters where my heart is. And if my heart is this, that everything I have belongs to God the Father, that it says that in my time, my talents, as Jesus is saying this morning, belong to him, and I'm giving back out of the abundance of my heart. But if my heart is full of evil this morning, I'm not going to give. I'm going to hold back and make excuses. I'm going to hold back and make excuses. And here's the deal. Man, if you got in your car this morning, and your car only started every third time, would you say my car is faithful? Let's say you told your kids they need to take a bath every day, but they need to take a bath once a week. Would you tell your kids you're being faithful? Let's say you went to work, and you know you're supposed to work Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, but you only went on Tuesday and Thursday. Would your boss say that you're faithful? AEP knocks on your door and says, you know what? You got a monthly electric bill, but you only paid one bill this year. Would you be faithful? How many of you skip church three weeks out of the month? Would you call yourself faithful? How many people skip church and yet you call yourself a faithful Christian? Yet the Bible says don't give a meeting together. It's an expectation. How many of us know that Jesus expects us to give from our heart, but we rob God, but you call yourself faithful? How many of us know that Jesus says that we need to go out and share our faith and make other disciples, but we don't share our faith, yet we want to be called faithful? Why is it everywhere else in our life we know that there's an expectation of obedience and there's an expectation of faithfulness and we're more faithful with the electric company and everything else in our life than we are with Jesus? We're more worried about the IRS, the electric company, and everything else than we're worried about what Jesus thinks about our behavior. Yet we want to be found faithful. We're more worried about our boss every single day than our Savior. I ain't going to show up to work and be late five days in a row if I want to have a job. But I'll be late for church every Sunday. Don't matter. I, I, I'll skip work for three weeks out of the month, show up one week and hope to have a job. Like it don't matter, but I'll skip a whole bunch of church and think nobody cares. Why is it that we don't have the same expectations? And you know what it is? Because the, the devil has lied to us and told us that Jesus doesn't really mean what he says. It doesn't mean like that. And what did Jesus look at you this morning? He says this. The amount entrusted each servant was in keeping his ability. Here's a statement I want to really you to find there for a second. Jesus expected and rewarded faithful obedience. Jesus expects obedience. Jesus expects commitment. Jesus expects faithfulness. So much so that he knew that we would have a tendency to be unfaithful. So he gives us his Holy Spirit whose job is to help us be faithful. And you know, imagine the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So every single time the Holy Spirit looks at your checkbook and knows you're robbing God, do you think the Holy Spirit's like, oh, good job, faithful? Or every single time the Holy Spirit is looking at you like, it's 11 o'clock, you should be in church, but you're in bed. You think the Holy Spirit inside of you is like, whoa, great job today. Or every single time that person's in front of you and the Holy Spirit is nudging you to share your faith, you're like, oh, not today. Are you faithful? I think what happens in the church nowadays is some of us, man, we've been lying to ourselves for so long that we consider ourselves a faithful Christian, but when we look at the Word of God and line up our life versus what Jesus' expectation is, there's a lot of unfaithfulness in the church. And we cannot be okay with that. Because Jesus tells this last servant who was unfaithful that you're about to get thrown into the fire. You cannot be unfaithful with Jesus and then get to heaven and say, I'm getting a pass. Jesus wants faithful obedience. 
You know what the faithless servant is this morning? Is a lukewarm person I talked about last week. The faithless person this morning is a lukewarm person. You're just apathetic. You don't care. You're just going about your life, doing what you want to do, thinking you're going to get by. Let me tell you something. You can die tonight. And if God punches your ticket tonight, you will give an account for your life. You will. That's a fact of Scripture. You want to be found unfaithful and faithful. That's the set of choices you're going to make the rest of the day. But God, I want to see you in heaven someday. Because I want to have a new beginnings party. But we cannot continue as a bunch of unfaithful people and expect God to bless us and be faithful to us. It doesn't work that way. We can't continue to, to struggle financially when so many people who call themselves a Christian don't tithe. I think that's okay. And we can't expect to win CK for Christ if the ones God has entrusted to share their faith are not sharing their faith but living for themselves. It don't work that way. But we're fighting a war, guys. We're fighting a serious war right now for our survival as a church, for the souls of our community, for our, our souls of our family. We're fighting a war because our flesh wants us to be unfaithful, but the Spirit of God wants us to be faithful. And you have to make a choice, man. If you've been living unfaithfully, it's time to repent. It's time to repent. First John 1 John 1.9 says that we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't be living a life where you expect more from your car than you expect from your relationship with Jesus. Don't live the kind of life where you're more worried about your lights being shut off than whether you're going to heaven or hell. And don't be raising the kind of kids that they're more worried about winning on the sports field than winning a life. That they're more worried about how good they look or how cute they look or what they're wearing than their faith. It, 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 there has to come a time where we decide that, you know what, the most important thing for us who call ourselves Christians is we're going to be faithful. Because here's what faithfulness is. Imagine you got up today and you told God, you know what, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've been robbing you. <laughs> I'm sorry that I haven't been sharing my faith. I'm sorry that I've been living for myself. But God, from this moment on, you can count on me. Why is it that we expect that of everybody else, man? I, I expect to count on the people around me. I expect my worship team to show up so we can have worship. Or I expect my kids to do their chores. Or I expect my car. Or I, expect, I, ex I expect to count on a lot of things. But can God count on you this morning? Can God count on you this morning? We expect faithfulness and reliability from a lot of things in our life. But does God expect the same from us? For a volunteer, almost anything seems acceptable. But for a bond servant who is duty bound, faithfulness is expected. Why is it that we know Gabe's going into the army? And boy, we expect Gabe to be a good little soldier. We expect Gabe to shave his head. We expect Gabe to keep his weight down. But we were rooting for him to be under a certain BMI and all that for two months. We expect Gabe to go into the military and obey man 100% completely so that Gabe will be a good little soldier, and yet we come into church and be unfaithful. How's that work? I want to read the last part of this, but... This is who Jesus is this morning. I want you to close your eyes and listen to this description. This is John. Now, John had all the excuses in the world because John was on an island by himself, banished. And, and he could have gave up and he could have quit. Yet Revelation 19 says this, then, I, then heaven opened. Imagine heaven opening before you this morning. And behold, a white horse. Imagine the most brilliant, most beautiful, most amazing, just stallion, the steed of a horse. Like one you've never seen before. Muscular, big, mighty, pure white, and just standing there. And the one sitting on that horse is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. 
out of his mouth. And when he speaks, it sounds like thunder and lightning and storms. It's so powerful. He's known as the righteous one and the holy one. His word is righteous. He himself is holy. And he calls all to himself to be faithful. That's what Jesus is this morning. Right now in heaven, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And he is called the faithful one, the true one. Jesus will never lie. He'll never let you down. He's always there for you. He has so much for you that his name is faithful and true. And what he wants from you is for your name to be faithful and true. He wants you to be with him someday in that place where you look and you see him on the stallion. And this is him returning, that he's going to come back and he's going to make war against the enemy. He's going to triumph and he's going to win. And everything that he says he's going to do because he is faithful, which means there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more wrongs. We are going to be with him for eternity, with everything made right before him. And he wants you to be with him. But in order for you to be with him, you have to be faithful to him. Though we are not saved by works, there's so much as things as saving faith. It's also not, it's also a serving faith. Church isn't something we watch, guys. It's something we do. So what are you doing for him? Are you giving him the best of what you have? Are you faithful? See, the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. And if you're faithful this morning, here's five areas I want you to think about. One, your spiritual disciplines. Those that are faithful to Christ will study, pray, and apply God's word because we want to know him. And that's what he expects. Number two is be committed to meeting together and make the church a priority. Jesus made the church such a priority, died for it. And all he's asked for us is to be faithful in meeting. The third area, if you're being faithful this morning, is to give faithfully. It's an expectation. The fourth area is serve. Use your talents and what you have to serve the church and loving others. So get in the word. Get in prayer. Apply it to your life. Be committed to meeting together as a church. Be the church. Let's give faithfully. Let's serve faithfully. And practice love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. We're going to take communion this morning. And I told Rami to fill up both trays this morning from now on because I want to, I want, you know what? It's pretty unfaithful to walk in church with no expectations. I could have just filled out 20 cups and said, well, every vacation, that's all we're going to probably have. And nobody would have any clown, but what if we came in church with expectation that God was going to move? What if we came in the church this morning and we didn't sit back here and have the conversation about, oh, I guess this is it. But we came in here expecting the place to be full. You know why it's going to be full? When we're faithful. That's what God's waiting for. God wants to blow new beginnings up, but it won't happen until we're faithful. Because why is he going to give us more people to lead when the people that are here are being unfaithful in some ways? It don't work that way. You pile on more unfaithful people and more unfaithful people, and the bills get bigger and the debt gets bigger and you know what to pay any of it. You can't do anything. But if those that are here are faithful with the little and the promise of Scripture is he'll give us much. Let's pray this morning. God, I pray this morning, God. And God, I know that that's a tough message, God, to think about because everything in our flesh wants us to be unfaithful. God, everything in my flesh wants it to be all about me. And, and yet, yeah, God, you died on the cross for me. Jesus, you gave your life for me, God, and you, you are so faithful, and you are so true. Revelations 19 says that you are standing on that white stallion in a robe drenched in blood, and it sounds like thunder and lightning when you speak, and, and you're nothing but truth. You are, you are faithful and true, faithful and true. John hears the words, you are faithful and true. God, would you please move on our hearts and our conviction that we, the church, would become more faithful and true to the mission and purpose of Jesus in our lives. God, I pray that we'd be so faithful to you, Lord, that, that we, would, we would not make excuse for getting in the Word, we'd be in the Word. We wouldn't make excuse for prayer, we'd be, we'd be prayer warriors. We wouldn't make excuse with our tithing, we would give, expecting you to open a flood house as you promised. 
God, I pray that we would be committed to coming to church and not making excuses about staying home or whatever it is, God, that we'd be committed because you said do not give up meeting together. God, I pray that we would be so faithful with the little things that you ask us to do, God, that then you would add to our number, God, and we would see expansive growth in your church. But God, I know that for us to be faithful, God, is the doorway to you doing those things. So God, I pray for somebody this morning who can remember my words that they know they've been unfaithful, God, with their finances. They know they've been unfaithful with their time and their commitment to you, God. And maybe they've gone the whole week, God, and this is really the first time they've even heard your word this week, God. God, I pray for a radical repentance of any Christian who's living that kind of life. That they would realize that unfaithfulness to you is not an option. But God, I praise you, God, that when we take the little steps of being faithful to you, that you cleanse us, you forgive us, God. And, you, and you've continued to work on us. So, God, I pray that this next week, God, each and every one of us would take a step closer to be more faithful to you, God, until the day comes that you declare us good and faithful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.